Welcome to our continuing series of virtual voices focusing on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Today, our speaker is Mr. Christian Schmidt. After a corporate career with large multinationals such as Bayer, BASF, and Henkel, Christian started his boutique consulting firm, Aventa, back in 2009 and offered strategic consulting to numerous international and domestic Japanese clients. He has built and ran several startups and invested as early stage angel investor. In 2019, he founded the PDIE Purpose Driven Innovation Ecosystems to connect innovators change makers and entrepreneurs on a global scale and foster sustainable innovation. PDIE Group is an official Earshot Prize nominator and has successfully nominated Earshot winners in the first two consecutive years. He currently acts as CMO and head of Asia for the global food and agriculture commodities trading platform, DCX. And since 2022, he assumed the position as senior advisor of the Future Food Institute. His passion is co-creating a better tomorrow through innovation. Over to you, Mr. Christian. Yeah, I have to say good morning uh, from uh, from Tokyo actually, because um, <clears throat> in in Tokyo it's uh, two o'clock in the morning right now. I just got up uh, fifteen minutes ago, um, out of a, a deep dream. Uh, I, maybe I was even dreaming the topic which I would be speaking about now, <clears throat> and um, just allow me to share my screen, <clears throat> I will be speaking about uh, building a future civilization based on purpose-driven innovation. <clears throat> I had this uh, same presentation at the University College of London, the Global Prosperity Institute in November last year. I always start uh, with, with the overview. Uh, we call it the overview effect. Uh, we go into space and look down on planet Earth and we see how everything is connected. And uh, the PDIE Purpose Driven Innovation Ecosystem is building a global network of innovators uh, from <clears throat> startups, corporations, investors, and uh, purpose-driven individuals in order to uh, co-create a better tomorrow. In uh, <clears throat> Japan, the word purpose uh, is now a very fashionable word, but when we started uh, in 2017, uh, we always had to explain uh, what is actually purpose. <clears throat> and the easiest way to explain it is to say um, in the beginning uh, of whatever you do, ask the reason why you're doing it. And <clears throat> when you're embarking on any kind of journey, if you know why you embark on this journey, you know what your purpose is. And it's all about, first of all, finding your own purpose in order to be able to connect with others. The situation <clears throat> we know is maybe <clears throat> a little bit like a thunderstorm. And <clears throat> we are speaking about the challenges of the 2020s, uh, the three divides. We have the social divide, a widening rich and poor gap, uh, we have the envi <clears throat> environmental divide, uh, climate change and biodiversity crisis. We have the spiritual and cultural divide, a behavioral gap by culture. We had the global pandemic and 
it might not have been the last one we experience. And uh, what I haven't added on this slide, we have a military conflict in the heart of Europe, um, which I as I mean, I'm German, I'm now living in Japan, but um, it is really uh, going very near also to the German people. We have exponential technology <clears throat> and with this exponential technology, uh, we have chances and risks. Uh, there is AI, big data, IOT, Internet of Things. We have we can build <clears throat> a connective world. Um, and recently um, I have attended the uh, World Economic Forum in Davos in January and one of the big topics has been chat GPT and uh, generative AI artificial intelligence what can that do and how can we actually um, cope with that beast or how can we uh, trigger a creative new renaissance uh, with AI to coexist uh, with with AI. So we have innovation, but innovation is locally limited and has no global access. Welcome to the VUCA world. I, I don't know if everybody knows what VUCA means. It's a term from military, uh, volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. And uh, the term VUCA was especially coined uh, for the Navy SEALs. They had to make decisions in an instant of a second. And in our modern world right now, uh, it seems that we are living in such kind of VUCA world where we don't know how tomorrow will be. And uh, we are all responsible. We are not just receiving, we are actors in, in this great theater, which is called our planet Earth. So from uh, being disconnected, closed off, scattered and ineffective, we should connect, scan, focus and act connecting means first like i said in the beginning uh, to connect to our own purpose and connect to other people and scan means to watch out in into the immediate future the, from the present situation <clears throat> and then scan the different possibilities we have in this kind of VUCA world to change it. And then we focus. We focus, we pick these activities or these areas where we think we can change something. And of course, uh, that's all theory. It's all the awareness. Uh, we need to act upon it. So the, the vision, uh, like I said in the beginning of PDIE Group is co-creating a better tomorrow by finding the most impactful and sustainable innovations and scale them to international markets. We are focusing on four different areas, renewable energy, clean water, food and agriculture, and circular economy. We build locally and scale globally. We work across the stakeholders Corporation startups, academia, we have uh, purpose driven individuals, and we have a global investor network. So we want to connect uh, capital with solution owners. We have the three pillars the PDIE Institute, it's a think and do tank. Uh, we bring experts together and create awareness, educate, and inspire. And if, like I said, we have to put this awareness into action. So we have uh, the consulting, which does business matching, 
investment matching and works on mindset shift with leaders. And the uh, PDIE ecosystem is working on identifying change makers by uh, curating different formats, smaller and larger events, venture building and PDIE projects. Last year, uh, we had a very successful uh, city summit about sustainable cities in the future. This is covering uh, mainly the sustainable development goal number 11, sustainable cities and communities. We brought together an international community of change makers. Um, I think uh, some of you are in New York, you might know um, the person on the left, Stefan Nicolo, he's uh, from a fund called Full Cycle. And if you like science fiction, uh, you might know Malka Alder. Uh, she has opened our two days uh, online symposium with challenging the status quo and also talking about how science fiction authors imagine the future. And people who are actors in policy actors in or CEOs of companies, basically they could be science fiction authors because they have to project the future out of now. So um, what we did is we brought together uh, the most outstanding group of future architects uh, for rethinking the way humans will live and interact in the future and how humans will coexist with nature. Uh, we were embarking on a journey to co-create self-sufficient, resilient and sustainable cities and communities, which would encompass the convergence of technology, culture, lifestyle, to cover the areas of clean energy, water, regenerative and circular production, health and well-being, as well as social and cultural aspects. By doing so, uh, we created a vibrant community uh, of people who actually want to change our current civilization into something which is um, more regenerative, more circular. And like I said, will change the way we coexist with nature. We target corporations, investors, startups, policymakers, and researchers. We collaborated with one of the best uh, Japanese institutes called uh, Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. This was, was a special project by the Japanese government. Uh, since 2020, no, to, uh, 2012, actually. So they have just celebrated their 10 years anniversary last year they have a couple of nobel prize winners the president which after the 10 years just retired actually he he retired but he's still in okinawa he's building an innovation park next to the university right now uh, if you don't know okinawa okinawa is the tropical island paradise uh, in the south of japan and um it's one of the most beautiful um, area for divers also because it has these uh, wonderful coral reefs and uh, really tropical nature. So if we look at uh, some facts on global cities, uh, we have now a worldwide 4 billion people living in cities. And we assume that by 2050, 7 billion people will live in metropolitan areas and cities. <clears throat> and the number of cities with more than 10 million people is currently 33 around the globe. Percentage of energy consumption, 80%. Percentage of global greenhouse gas emissions is also 80%. And global waste production is 2.01 billion tons. It's hard to imagine this amount of waste actually. And we have also the air quality index, uh, nine of 10 people in megacities have no access to fresh air. 
uh, we are lucky here in Tokyo uh, because Tokyo has relatively fresh air and Tokyo has managed uh, quite well um, the tra uh, traffic. It's, it's one of the best public transport systems in the world. Uh, you have trains every minute or every two minutes. You have the Shinkansen, which connects uh, Tokyo with Osaka and Kyoto and even Fukuoka on the southern island of Kyushu. So, um, yeah, it, it takes the pressure out of, of the systems. And these are the socio-technical systems in cities. Uh, we have mobility. So uh, PDIE Group uh, regularly holds sessions on the future uh, of something. And we just yesterday had a future lunch on uh, future of mobility, which was very interesting. We have food systems, energy, waste, water systems, and air quality. These are the social technical systems in cities. We asked key questions. If by 2050, 70% of the world population is supposed to live in cities and metropolitan areas, how will humans live in greater harmony with nature? How will we cope with the challenges of climate change and create a zero emission economy? How will we create a human society with happiness, health, and well being? How can rural areas be revitalized in the post COVID era? How can we produce energy, food, and jobs in a self sufficient and sustainable way? And how can we live in a 100% circular way? Yeah, so <clears throat> um, asking these questions would trigger um, a lot of um a lot of things and a lot of innovation so one of the intentions was to create a fertile seedbed for innovation by inspiring scientists policymakers and investors to take completely new approaches and yeah like i said maybe or already two times reinvent the way we coexist with nature it's, it's really everything um we we have to do we need to do uh, to create a new civilization is to shift from ego systems economy to ecosystem ecosystems economy where an ecosystem this comes of course also from nature is where there is a mutual benefit of coexistence <clears throat> this is what many people might not know about uh, the Society 5.0 vision of Japan coming from uh, Society 1.0, hunter and gathering to agriculture 2.0 to industrial civilization 3.0 and then information society 4.0 and then uh, creating Society 5.0. This was the the vision put forward by the Japanese government, the cabinet office, in 2016. Um, and just recently, uh, the uh, Ministry of uh, Science and Technology in Japan came up with something called the Moonshot Program. They defined nine goals, which, which are partly derived from this Society 5.0. So here, the three key words for Society 5.0 is comfort, um, benefit everyone, regardless of age and gender, um, create uh, everyday life uh, in happiness and well-being, and have, have a really balanced economic advancement with a resolution of social problems. And <clears throat> vitality, that that's also connecting again to this this moonshot program there's one goal which says uh, let's age without any difficulties and with with um being healthy basically 
and this uh this is actually the moonshot program um it's it's you might uh, smile a little bit when um, you see the illustrations and you know that Japan likes these kind of manga uh, you know what a manga is a, a comic so uh, goal one overcoming limitations of body brain space and time this means that even disabled people uh, can access um, much more than before because of cyber physical systems and the possibility to create avatars uh, which can be <clears throat> i don't know if you have heard about bci a brain computer interface this is something where even without having gestures and hand uh, you could just with your mind focus on a dashboard and then trigger activities in a virtual space and then you have a lot which is related to um the next frontier which is uh, the human brain developing a fault tolerant universal quantum computer and have computing basically outpace the human brain yeah so then you can look at this maybe later and i just wanted to show three different uh, visions of a potential uh, future civilization and I hope that you you can see and hear the sound. So I, I will try to start this video. This is a Toyota's uh, vision, uh, the Woven City. It's a project which has already been kicked off in 2020. So they, they are building uh, this city uh, on the old ground of a Toyota factory for about 3,000 people. Um, and in the beginning, when Akio Toyoda, uh, he's, uh, uh, he, I mean, he stepped down from his position as a CEO and is now the chairman. Um, and his son, Daisuke Toyoda, he's, he's heading this new division in Toyota, which is called Woven Planet. Uh, they, they deal with everything related to cities and mobility. You can see the flying drones here, which would deliver things. Uh, you have this community space, which is for the whole city to come together and experience interesting events. And this would be uh, near Mount Fuji. Uh, you know, Mount Fuji is a dormant uh, volcano. It's the highest mountain in Japan, 3,776 meters high. So that's a woven city. And then uh, people who have been in Davos at the World Economic Forum might have come across the vision of Saudi Arabia, which uh, people have different attributes to. Some people say crazy. Some people say uh, impossible. Other people say, wow, this is amazing. And um, I show you a video about the line. For too long. You cannot hear the sound, right? Yes. Now you can hear the sound. Yes. Ah, okay. A revolution in civilization is taking place. Imagine a traditional city and consolidating its footprint, designing to protect and enhance nature. The line will be home to 9 million residents and will be built with a footprint of just 34 square kilometers. And we are designing it to provide a healthier, more sustainable quality of life. The line's communities are organized in three dimensions. Residents have access to all their daily needs within five minute walk neighborhoods. And the line's infrastructure makes it possible to travel end to end in 20 minutes with no need for cars resulting in zero carbon emissions. By leveraging AI technology, services are autonomous, saving you time and effort. Designed by world leading architects, the line is 500 meters tall, 200 meters wide, 170 kilometers long, and housed within an elegant mirror glass facade. Intelligent solutions create efficiency and year-round temperate microclimate with natural ventilation. 
energy and water supplies are 100% renewable. The line is designed as a series of unique communities offering a wealth of amenities, providing equitable views and immediate access to the surrounding nature. With 40% of the world accessible within six hours at the heart of the globe's key trade routes, a place for commerce and communities to thrive like nothing on earth seen before. The line, the city that delivers new wonders for the world. So this, this is um, Saudi Arabia. And uh, there's a third one, uh, which I will show you now, uh, which is called Orchid City. Person from the Netherlands uh, called Tom Bosch Boschert who came up with, with a blueprint for this new civilization. And um, so Orchid City is uh, actually uh, one of our ecosystem partners. Well, the Netherlands uh, is definitely an innovator. And since I travel all through Japan, so is Japan. Uh, yes. So, and Saudi Arabia, I have, uh, we have uh, basically interns that were in our UN program uh, from Saudi Arabia. So I know that they're doing a tremendous amount of changing. So those three places definitely are the ones that have the potential of changing things. Yeah. So um, what is especially also interesting about Orchid City, I mean, and Orchid City uh, has made uh, also an initiative uh, which would aim to um, rebuild the Ukraine. Uh, if, I mean, if this stupid war would come to an end um, <clears throat> and uh, there, there is, um, Actually, there's a separate presentation which would talk about uh, how to do that. And um, <clears throat> maybe I could um, I could highlight this in a if we have an, another chance or I can send send you uh, this presentation. But no, uh, we we definitely would like to invite you in about four or five weeks to talk about that, because maybe by that time, since NATO decided finally to give Ukraine some planes, they will be able to stop the continual attack. So it will be a great pleasure to have you again talk about that. And at that time, you could also talk with uh, Dr. Mia Moro and see but you could have a, a similar perspective and change in your views that could benefit each other. Right. <clears throat> Great. So um, here, what it's it's a kind of a, a summary um, about the different views um, we could see in this presentation, and I call it nature human centric design where really the human being is put in the center of the considerations. And we focus on communities, culture, and exchange. We have a green city approach, uh, sustainable mobility, adaptation, and resilience, and happiness before convenience. And then we have technocratic design, a technocracy where uh, basically, um, yeah, the human aspects are overruled by technology, uh, we have uh, IoT, AI, big data. We have robots for elderly care instead of having humans taking care of elderly people. Uh, we have a job replacement by automation. And we have, in general, a computerized trajectory. So it's, all, it's of course, a question which pathway we choose as humanity. Do we stay human as much as possible and utilize technology to serve us or would we go into a direction where technology would um, be the main focus and we would be uh, basically um, yeah, becoming uh, slave citizens of technology. So um, I have summarized this also in, in terms of redefining this word purpose-driven innovation. Uh, human, so purpose-driven innovation, like I said in the beginning, uh, starts with asking the reason why. 
Um, so it's good for humans and it's fostering social cohesion. It's good for nature uh, and we have to uh, shift to circular systems which do not extract from nature anymore. And of course, it's good for the planet. It's creating a healthy planet with prosperity, health and happiness for all life, not only for human beings. So we need to reinvent economic systems and also redefine human values. And uh, with that being said, uh, I always encourage everybody, let's co-create the future. Uh, we are all part of it. Uh, we are all responsible and we can all be future architects of this kind of new civilization and everything which the mind can conceive and believe the mind can achieve and over the history of human humans we have seen civilizations coming and going but um i believe that with all the technology and everything we have right now uh, we can really create a beautiful a new civilization so that's um basically the end of my presentation um thanks very much for inviting me to this um auditorium thank you so much well thank you very very much for an extremely interesting and informative presentation and uh, basically because we have a lot of questions i will just mention one thing that your focus on connect can focus and act in my opinion what we need to do is act and as i said to in my former webinar that basically uh, the goal 17 and 16 of the sustainable development goals is focusing exactly on that we need to build a world community which doesn't destroy, but actually helps each other. So we need to eliminate those actors that are only interested in destruction. So now um, I am focusing and turning over to our moderator, Susie Halleck. Susie, over to you. Thanks, Dr. Durbeck. And thank you so much, Christian, for the interesting presentation. We have a ton of questions from the audience members. So first one is, it's a good thing that we can still turn around climate change and other negative implications on our environment, but the clock is ticking so and we may be running out of time so how much do you think we have to solve this global issue and will societies be able to correct their previous mistakes. I appreciate it's a loaded question so you, you mean um, how, how much time we have or yes. what, what? so that, that's the essence of the question. Um. I mean, Albert Einstein said that time is relative, space is relative, um, and it really depends on how we are dealing with the issue. And I mean, what, what I can see more and more is that uh, this whole uh, discussion around climate change um, gets much more in attention. But unfortunately, of course, we are distracted by these kind of ecosystem economy type of things like uh, having geopolitical um, crisis uh, like with Russia and Ukraine. And um, things like this can actually be a throwback in, in um, and even also the pandemic, uh, the last three years, people think that it, it was helpful because uh, of the lockdowns, uh, we didn't emit so much greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but on the other hand, what you said right now that people need to come together, need to speak to each other and also meet in person uh, in order to really build a trust which is necessary, build the partnerships which are necessary and also uh, connect the different actors and um, innovators to each other. This is very, very essential to overcoming the crisis. So, yeah, I mean, we have some magical borderlines uh, which have been defined 
for example, by the Paris Agreement in 2015, uh, the uh, Sustainable Development Goals uh, lead us to 2030. And then uh, we look beyond 2030. And most of the developed countries have this agenda, which foresees uh, net zero by 2050. And I believe that 2050 is too far out. Uh, it the people who are responsible now, they will not be there anymore. Uh, so we should have more accountability uh, for these kind of things. And um, we actually have a lot of uh, amazing innovations and technologies. And this, this is something what uh, we as PDIE group are looking into. And um, we have accumulated a portfolio of innovations uh, across the globe um, and what I can see is that more and more also the the world of uh, investors and capital are really drawn into that and they they want to connect and they want to know from us what they should invest into so <laughs> it becomes more and more important that uh, people who who have a clear vision um, can somehow um, become um, connectors and, and hubs in really building the right um, mix of technology as well. And it's not only technology, it's regenerative systems design, uh, regenerative agriculture, and these different things. And um, so I, I believe um we should not fall into a dystopian kind of mood uh, we we should like uh, i don't know if you know christiana figueres uh, urgent optimism she they they are calling it urgent optimism so <laughs> we we actually create a, a new civilization out of joy and uh, rather than uh, creating it out of pain um, everything you create out of pain will again create pain. So I, I would like to avoid this. I don't know if this answers the question, but... Um, it does. Yeah, okay. Thank you for the response. Um, our next question is, how do world changes affect our ability to build a new civilization? And what should each of us do during times of global change to improve our civilization? Okay, so that, that's a question which is targeting the kind of micro level. Um, what can everybody, each each of us do uh, when the world is changing? And um, I mean, I think you, you already answered uh, part of this question when, when you said um, that, did you say a goal number 16 or 17? So it's goal number 16. As a piece, piece. Uh, Peace, peace and responsibility and society working together rather yes. than being disconnected and uh, society focusing on attacking each other to achieve uh, some delusional goals. Exactly. So, and that's what, what we always call the, um, the shift from ecosystems to ecosystems. And uh, that's really um the essence of answering this question so always try to uh, connect and uh, try to develop uh, communication and understanding uh with other people even you know what what i'm doing is uh, sometimes i'm spending uh, time alone i'm going into a cafe and then uh, if i see somebody sitting there alone intentionally take a seat uh, and then uh, start uh, an accidental conversation and, and sometimes you're really surprised uh, what you can find out and how you can connect uh, to other people so connecting with other people also beyond borders um, and finding out uh, what they're thinking about um, what they're believing in and then connecting and bridging the differences th this is a, a starting point thank you um, so what do you think are the um, 
potential positive and negative consequences of innovation. For example, an audience member asked whether you think modern technologies such as smartphones, social networks can kind of um, deteriorate people's feelings and the human connection. So that was a potential uh, negative impact that they mentioned. What's your response to this? And do you, what do you think are the positive and negative <laughs> impacts? Yeah, I, I think I think it's true. Um, I have uh, two boys, uh, 10 and 14. And actually, my brother had sent me a book uh, when when we were deciding to give the first smartphone to my older son. Uh, and it was written by a professor from Ulm in Germany. Ulm is a city in the south of Germany. Yes, uh, I know. Uh, yeah. And um, it, this was about digital dementia. So, um, and it was warning actually to give too early electronic devices to uh, children. Uh, because it creates an, a kind of an addiction. And um, yeah, we, we are a little bit struggling with our older son now. Um, I mean, he, on the one hand side, uh, he is amazing on computers, much better than me. And uh, he is attending a programming school uh, aside from, from the normal school. Uh, so I think uh, his capabilities are way beyond uh, what I can even now ever achieve. But um, on the other hand, he's, he's really into these kind of devices. And I don't know if, if it will uh, diminish the capability of emotions and feeling. And this might be a, uh, different from person to person, but it's definitely, um, it's definitely a risk. And that, that's what I alluded on uh, in the slide where I was speaking about the chances and risks of uh, exponential technology. Well, so he is in the Hochschule. And the other thing which which I can also say about technology is that um, with any kind of technology, uh, we have to have a kind of a system thinking approach uh, because some technologies look as if they would be solving a certain problem but when solving this problem it creates other externalities at the same time so we need to always evaluate um, the impact in a more holistic way and avoid these kind of additional externalities thank you um, another audience member asked, what do you mean by the civilization of the future? And they were curious about how you see the future civilization in, say, 100 years. Like, what changes will happen? And do you think it's possible to live in a 100% circular way in the future? It, that's a great question. I, I have uh, written a, f um, a few kind of abstracts and... Um, uh, I had defined different um, different uh, points. Like uh, I, th I think it. I cannot recall the five points right now, but um, uh, we. So the future civilization. First of all, um, it would ideally. I mean, and and when I'm speaking about it, uh, immediately the word utopia comes up, and. Um, People uh, believe that this is basically, utopia is impossible, <clears throat> but it, it all starts from, um, from believing in possibilities. <clears throat> we have defined the values of our PDIE group. And one of the values is that uh, instead of pinpointing problems, we look into possibilities. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, a utopian world would, I mean, for me, it would be a world, uh, first of all, where uh, people are happy and healthy, uh, people can more connect to each other, um, <clears throat> and people have uh, the space uh, and the capability to enjoy uh, what they are passionate about. And 
while they are doing what they're passionate about, they would also contribute uh, to the to the larger um, collective. And we would have found uh, ways how to really uh, create a balance between the natural world and I mean, actually, th this is wrong. Um, we don't need to create a balance because we are nature. So human human beings are part of nature. And uh, we need to realize this. And we need to um, yeah, reestablish this lost connection with nature. So uh, I'm, I'm already, uh, I mean, not already, but I'm practicing this that um, I spent every day i spend time in nature even here in tokyo you you might not think it's possible but uh, we have um the meiji shrine for example which which is a is an old forest which has been planted after the meiji emperor died 100 years ago by a team of forestry scientists and it's it's so refreshing to uh, walk around this uh, forest in the middle of tokyo and Recently, uh, sometimes I invite other people, for example, visitors, and instead of spending the time in a meeting room, uh, we have a, a long walk uh, through the forest, and this produces uh, great ideas. Thank you. Um, one audience member asked if you don't mind repeating which institutions you're working with currently and just talking a bit about why organizations like PDIE are important and can help change our future. Um, yeah, so uh, we we have, we just, I mean, yesterday uh, in the afternoon, we had a panel with our partnership organization here in Japan, which is called uh, the the four refs movement uh, four refs stand for four revolution and um we have defined these four revolutions as uh, the survival challenges for humanity which we need to fix in this generation <clears throat> and um they also have uh, an umbrella organization called nelis next generation leaders in sustainability which operates on all the continents and um, now, for example, in April, uh, we are supporting uh, the Africa Summit in Kenya. Uh, it's April 24-25. And um, we will bring together um, about 500 people from uh, policymakers, investors, uh, startup entrepreneurs, and uh, corporate people. Uh, also to curate these kind of solutions. And then uh, the partnerships, um, I mean, Orchid City was an example for one of the partnerships uh, in terms of urban design. And um, we have a partnership with the Earthshot Prize, um, which is Prince William's initiative to fix the planet by innovation. Uh, Prince William and uh, Sir David Attenborough founded this in 2020 and in the first two years uh, miraculously a PDIE group has been the number one nominator nominating game-changing innovation and um, we have been uh, keeping up the work and uh, the 2023 um, nominations uh, turn out uh, to be very interesting because we already have feedback now that uh a number of our nominations is in this in the next round um so we have um also a, a partnership with uh, organization from switzerland called seed stars uh, they focus on emerging markets and entrepreneurship uh, we have some investor groups in our um partnership portfolio and so there are part, there are some some city like Smart City X is a Japanese initiative and Orchid City is this other initiative which is uh, more the self sufficient and resilient small cities and communities and um, yeah so what is important how to how to choose this partnership and and why are organizations like PDIE important. Um, 
one aspect um what how i can answer this question is um pdie for example is bringing together um people from uh, many different angles and perspectives and uh, we have uh, about 1000 innovators uh, in in and we have we are for example if we put together a future lunch like yesterday with future of mobility we invite people from a corporate background uh, but we always invite uh, some people who for example an artist or they are a writer or um, and they have maybe a more creative and more impulsive way to um, interact and to see <clears throat> the, the present and also the possibilities so yeah and that's that's important because like also like albert einstein said um, imagination is greater than knowledge thank you and that kind of ties back to the next question which is do you have a person who motivates and inspires you curious <laughs> if that if that's who it is or if you'd like to talk about somebody else yeah yeah um <clears throat> maybe one reason why i mean uh, i like music and um i study a lot about um uh, baroque and classical music and then i try to discover um composers uh, who people have never heard about. Um, I'm also interested in literature and um, my father my father has been or is a, a, a physicist. He is a scientist and um, that's maybe a, a reason why I'm so interested in and curious about uh, science. So Maybe I could say that my father is one of the most inspiring people uh, and that he he leads to everything else what um, I came across in in my life. Like Albert Einstein, for example, or Goethe or Mozart, Bach, and and then all these other more unknown composers. Thank you. Um, so you talked a lot about various challenges that that uh, have happened in past years and what challenges await us in the future. Um, what do you think will be the most difficult challenges that lie ahead? Definitely, I mean, one, one of these challenges is climate change and also the um, destruction of biodiversity. We are losing a lot of um, species on our planet, uh, which, uh, I mean, we separate nature and humans, but we shouldn't separate it. So um, we should do more to protect uh, nature. And um, that's, so climate change and biodiversity is, is one of the challenges. Then, then AI is also a challenge, um, but it can also be uh, some uh, tool for us. Uh, we have now also an AI ambassador at MIT in Boston. And uh, he will have a TED talk actually um, soon, and he will deal with with that topic of creating a a new um, a new society of creation with with AI. And uh, what else? Um, yeah, we have. I mean, all this exponential technology which we have access to, nanotechnology, uh, quantum computing. The convergence of all these technologies uh, this is a double-edged sword and um, we can utilize it for doing great things but we can also utilize it to to actually eliminate our human existence so uh, we should be very aware of this and that's why i said in the end uh, human values so we we need to define what makes us human uh, for the future and uh, to preserve this also that that we are we are humans and we don't want to become a technology uh, given the different microclimates you talked about and um, climate change occurring in various climate zones are you aware of any um, ways or methods that uh, companies are coming up with of in terms of how we influence it to to prevent major droughts or floods in different areas 
Uh, yes, I mean, <clears throat> in Africa, for example, you have the, the green wall uh, project, uh, maybe you have heard about in the sub-Saharan areas to plant um, forests or plant um, more vegetation. <clears throat> and um, I think uh, there are different initiatives around this. And uh, we had nominated an interesting uh, consortium uh, and they, they were producing um, robots for tree planting in order to scale um, and accelerate the um, ability to, to plant and grow these um, forests. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned that you were in or you attended the World Economic Forum in Davos. Could you talk about what your most valuable insight that you took away from the experience? And do you really feel like societies and governments and companies are planning to make the planet more sustainable on a massive scale? Yeah, so <clears throat> I mean, there are many different uh, companies and different uh, intentions, uh, depending on what company you are in. Um, <clears throat> I met a senior executive of Lockheed Martin. It's a military company, so um, I wouldn't say that um, they have the same goals and intentions. But even they are using the word sustainability and 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 so on. I also <clears throat> attended a reception with the CEO of Aramco. Aramco is the oil <clears throat> company of Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> and um, I could see a different perspective that, I mean, they, they built their wells on oil and <clears throat> they believe that um, the, the transition to renewable energy is necessary, but <clears throat> they want they don't want to happen. They don't want it to happen uh, too fast. Actually, they they want to um, <clears throat> still enjoy more of of their wells with oil instead of <clears throat> accelerating the pathway. But on the other hand, uh, you can see so many people um, who <clears throat> are really driven, and there was this SDG tent. Uh, which was um, established by Andre Hoffmann, uh, who who be, uh, belongs to the INSEAD community, and um, he was a family member of Hoffmann La Roche, the pharmaceuticals company, <clears throat> and he is very much into sustainability. Um, and a lot of brilliant people came together in this SDG tent, also at the Goals House, and there were all these side events where people from the main forum and people uh, who would just attend. Um, you have white batch, a white batch gives you access to the main forum and you have hotel batches, which give you access to the hotels. And then you have people who don't have anything of this and are just attending everything around the forum. And <clears throat> everybody who came to, to the World Economic Forum um, Every person you speak to was interesting. Every pe every person was uh, highly motivated, and um, it gave me a lot of hope, and it created a lot of new connections and um, also inspiration. So I I think uh, it's it's a good thing to bring people together in such kind of uh, accelerated way, and um, the collective intelligence I had the feeling is is now going towards more partnership, more working on solving the problems instead of only talking about problems. Thank you for sharing. Um, so during your presentation, you mentioned you work in a few different areas such as renewable energy, clean water, food and agriculture, tech, circular economy. Uh, which of these is the most difficult to work in and could you please share the most successful project you've led? Uh, <laughs> that's, um, there's so, so many different areas, but, um, most difficult that it's, it's, it's the question also in, in which sense difficult, um, because, um, 
yeah, everything has complexity. <clears throat> and at the moment, uh, we are working, for example, on a on a project to uh, revolutionize uh, aviation um, with hypersonic jet, uh, which is flying on hydrogen fuel. And <clears throat> along this example, it, it will trigger a lot of questions. Uh, if you reach hypersonic speed, uh, you have this, um, um, how you call it, hypersonic boom. Uh, it creates a, a huge noise and some, uh, so how, how to overcome this, how to, also overcome the the hydrogen. Um, hydrogen has to be uh, suppressed uh, with with high pressure and and it can explode potentially. So it, this has to be prevented. The safety aspect and um, most difficult, maybe most difficult. Um, I, I have I have an idea. Most difficult is a human element actually. So <laughs> that. Uh, because we still have always the ego factor. And um, if there is something which looks attractive, um, people, instead of creating a, a larger um, pie, um, they want the biggest piece of this pie. And this prevents collaboration. So we need to find ways how to, how to um, accelerate collaboration and Eliminate and, greed. Yeah, greed. Ex exactly. So that that's <laughs> yes. Well, uh, actually, uh, I was going to mention that I think that your presentation is absolutely excellent, and we look forward to hearing again from you uh, in about four or five weeks. And hopefully, you'll be able to bring us your data on the population and. Uh, I just found your presentation extremely interesting and informative, and I know that all the people that have listened to it gain a great deal from the knowledge that you have accumulated. And Susie, thank you very much for moderating, and I wish you a very, very healthy and happy future. Bye-bye.